Buenos días a todos. Yo soy muy feliz porque mi hombre, mi, 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 uh, my brother, ¿cómo, ¿cómo se dice? Mi hermano, mi, hermano, mi hermano, no soy tu hombre. Mi, mi hombre. <laughs> hey, hombre. That's a my, bad hombre. This is a terrible intro. <laughs> my, my buddy, one of my best friends in the whole wide world, Jose Rubio is here all the way from China of all, even though his name is Jose Rubio, he is indeed in China right now. How are you, Jose? What's up? ¿Qué pasó, papi? I am here. I am good. I am happy to be joining you. And uh, yeah, it's morning. I know it's nighttime over there for you, but it it's is, morning yes. over here. So we're, we're playing morning. some time travel. We're going to be listening to video game music together. You haven't listened to video game music since the Super Nintendo, but you said you like to watch my videos because you're supportive, but also, um, <laughs> but also because, uh, because you like to watch people play video games. I do. Like I, I was super into video games back when the Nintendo and the Super Nintendo were rocking. Um, N64. That was like I'm gonna go to my best friend's house and play games. That's the there. jam. Yeah, but I never, I never really got into it. But like GoldenEye and Mario Kart were the Word. thing back then. So, oh yeah, amen. Uh, but uh, well, but, yeah. Still but ever since then, yeah, they still are. Ever since then, like. I've got buddies that are gamers and stuff. And whenever I go over to their houses and they're like, do you want to play? I was like, no, but I'll watch you play. Like, this is, this is fun. It's like watching a movie, but you get to interact and yeah, yeah, yell at yeah. the characters. Well, so I'm going to give you a crash course on what I feel are uh, the like really great tracks from the last X amount of years. You know, a, a lot of opera in this and, um, and yeah, let's, let's, let's show, not tell. And uh, we'll get to what we get to. Now you said, you said you really love. So, Oh, I lost oh, your audio. It's so loud. It's on my end. Hang on, hold on. Ah, where is this? Oh, here it is. Okay. Um, you said before I asked you if you like heavy metal because I was thinking about what I wanted to do for you. And you said you like to listen to folk and indie pop and you love Latin pop. And so I thought to myself, hmm, Latin music. And so I have a couple things here that I think you'll appreciate. So the first thing we're going to listen to is an oldie but a goodie. It's called Gerudo Valley from The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Surely you know this piece if you had an N64 or you went to your friend's house and watched it. It's like Gypsy Kings. Yeah. <laughs> Gypsy Kings. <laughs> <laughs> Synthetic Gypsy Kings. I love yeah. it. I'm just waiting for the mariachi to roll out, you know? I know. I got my ukulele out there. Wrong, <laughs> wrong finger, this one. Harmony, yeah. They got the, the, the <laughs> unison harmony. movement. Yeah. <laughs> like the clapping. <laughs> right. This is rad. You're a Latino Americano. You're very proud of of your, you know, your upbringing, and I know that. Like, does does that does that like connect? Does that feel like at all? So this is made by Koji Kondo. You know, does that does that somehow do you do you feel like that's a legitimate soundscape? That is something that you you would hear. You know what I mean? Like at a party or something? Like how 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 far away is that from the lot Latino sound quality? I mean, it's an immediate nod to the latin culture it's an immediate soundscape of the latin culture it's an immediate recognition like you hear that and you're like yes that is latin and not music. a caricature though not like not like a funny take on it like a legitimate yeah i mean look this music is like it's it makes you feel something 
This right. makes you feel like it's Latin music, whether it's really Latin music or not. I mean, like who who really cares at this point, right? But like you listen to that and it takes you into that world. And I think that's what's great about it is that immediately I would be like, oh, cool. They're doing a Latin thing, right? Like I, <laughs> yeah. I don't care who wrote it. I can't tell. And I mean, there is sort of the limitations of what video game music sounded like at that time, you know? Right. So it's all yeah. like probably done at a keyboard or something like that. But Yeah, the MIDI, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but no, that's awesome. I love that. Yeah, it's like a bright, yeah. effervescent sort of thing. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like yeah. fun. Have you ever played Halo? Uh, uh, maybe like momentarily. Yeah. I, I've gotten killed on Halo before. Yeah, I yeah. I have, I have yeah. no relationship to Halo. And and one, one of the things that I want to do as soon as possible is play through all of them because they're like one of these like titular, like most important gaming experiences. And, mm-hmm. and, um, and I just haven't played it. So like people often ask for Halo music, but I don't know, I don't know what to offer because I just have no emotional connection to it. But I know that this theme, the Halo 2, uh, Mjolnir Nick mix of the main theme from Halo, which you know that you know the Halo theme song. Oh, 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 oh. yeah. All right, now let's 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 take a step back and let's listen to the <laughs> Halo theme song. <laughs> let's take a step back. Okay, you don't know it. Okay, that's not good. All right, here we go. We'll we'll take a step back. I'm yeah. sure I've heard it like, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure once you listen to it, it, once you listen to it, we'll listen to it together. How about that? It's like when you hear oh, yeah. Carmen yeah. in a commercial, you've never heard this piece. If you don't know it by now, you don't know it. Wow. That's fascinating. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it. I'm, I'm sure it's it's picked into my soundscape at some point, but I just yeah, yeah, all right. In a way that I can recognize. It's, it's fun. It's a good one. It's a classic. On the way on those strings. Nice big strings down there. Okay. Very, I, I get vibes of like Pirates of the Caribbean a little bit. <laughs> they've got sort of like the native sort of. Uh, yeah, there's a tribal type, quality in it, right? Tribal quality, yeah. The beginning of the Gregorian chant, like it's all sort of layered, different, different mm-hmm. things going on. The strings are really nice. The super like galvanizing theme, right, of like marching forward mm-hmm. towards something, yeah. Yeah, like the war drums also the professor. Yeah. And then you get the amble in the back. There you go, a little amble. Amble, amble popper. first. Pause there. <laughs> I love the ethereal like chord. Then it resets when it returns back to the ending. That's like one of the most iconic video game pieces ever. And what's really nice about it actually is how it uses the male chorus. And I can't remember the etymology. There's like a story here that like it was like recorded in a car or something last minute. And I, I can't remember. And it's like all Marty O'Donnell saying, I can't remember what the like the lore is there, but Marty O'Donnell is the composer. And what's really cool to me is that uh, I talked to Marty. Mar- Marty is like a, like a classically trained composer, you know, like uh-huh. he, he writes 
cl- I mean, classical music. And and Halo, this music, uh, and he was in a, a he composed for a game as well, Destiny. And they're they're so classically based. Like that book ending thing is is such a thing that we hear all the time in classical music, you know. But but anyway, uh, what do you what do you think about that? I mean that that's a pretty old one. Um, it's a classic. I mean, I think I think most of this music, like it's it's super creative, mm-hmm. and it immediately puts you into a world, right? right? Like everything that is being used is something that is really evocative of something that we're already familiar with, right? Right. Like the fact that we're able to identify, okay, this sounds like chant. Okay, this kind of sounds like war drums. There's sort of a tribal instinct here. You know, there's some sort of, you know, like it takes all these things that, you know, for lack of a better explanation, they know that we're going to be triggered by, maybe not triggered is the right word, but we're going to be uh, associating with something. Yeah. And they put it together to already create some sort of a story, sorry. you know, that, that we... I just, I'm sorry. <laughs> My shirt says send noodles. Oh, bro, I'm in China. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> wow. I'm so sorry. But seriously, this is a great shirt. Uh, anyway. Uh, it <laughs> so yes, it puts you in. I'm sorry. It's like so. <laughs> it's so like in your face. Um, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, it puts you it puts you in a spot. It puts you in like a, a in a world. And in a way, do you feel like it's 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 kind of programmatic like like opera, right? Because like you immediately when you hear, you know, um the overture, well, the overture of Tosca, boom, 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 cha, you immediately know, ba, 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 you immediately know where you are and what what the stakes are, right? Yeah, but I think that's because we know the opera, right? Mm. Like when you hear that for the first time, do you feel like it's already evoking something that you already know? Like this, I heard it for the first time and it's things that I already was familiar with being used to create something. Oh yeah, that's an you interesting know? point, yeah. But like when you hear an opera for the first time, like, I don't know, the first time you hear something super iconic like Carmen or, you know, it's it might be evocative of something, but we associate all that with Carmen. So we're like, oh, we know this. We know that this is mm. bullfighter music, you know, when mm-hmm, I do an mm-hmm. SMA or something like that. We know that's what that is. But did they know that that was bullfighter music until they saw the bullfighter walk out for the first time? Or, you know, because now we do, but uh, that's a really good did back then. Yeah. No, and that's such a good point. And, and- and I wonder then if, if like the modern video game person who plays these games, when they hear this music, it's like it, because there are parts of it that they sort of intrinsically can like feel and understand from day to day life or something that they're able to like connect with it almost instantly. Um, but I, what I would say, it's funny cause this is a main theme and we're going to play another main theme. That's going to be very wow. different in a second, but, but it's interesting how these, this, a main theme, like an overture of, of a piece, it's sort of like showcasing to you what's about to occur. And at the same time, uh, it immediately puts you in a, in a place of, of recognition of, of what's to come, you know, mm-hmm. it's cool. Do you like that piece? Halo? I do. Yeah, yeah. It's okay if you don't like stuff, by the way. I think some people sometimes are afraid. They're like, I like that. If you fucking hate something, just let it be known. I mean, like, it's, it's I don't know. What, what music don't I like? It's, That's it's, the thing. It, it, serves a, it serves a purpose, right? I mean, all this music is part of a narrative, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that we get really attached to video game music the same way that we... You know, and sometimes the same way that we get attached to a film score or something, because look, I still remember video game music from the original Nintendo and the Super Nintendo because I remember what it felt like when I was playing those games. Yeah, yeah. That that is what I remember. And I think, oh, I love that song. Not because necessarily the merit of that song, but what it made me feel when I heard it and while it was yeah. playing. And I, I think that that's um that's a really important thing to also think about too, is like it's funny. Context is a really funny thing because a lot of people are like, oh, well, you don't know what it feels like until you've experienced that moment in the game with that music. And I actually, I used to buck against that, but I actually really agree with it. But what I would say is that there is something so deeply, like almost like 
metaphysical about what it means to um, like connect to a piece of music from a, a time in our own lives. Right. Mm-hmm. So even if it is related to a context, like if you and I are playing a game at three in the morning, every, every day for a month, and we then have to stop playing in five years, I may hear that theme. And while yes, I'm going to connect it to that moment in the game, I will more than likely connect it to my time with you playing it for a month. So like where I was, it's interesting. Being how up late at night, 3 a.m. Yeah. All those things. All the, it's like a smell, you know? Yeah. A smell you, you ha- it has value not only because of what something actually smells like in that moment, but what it triggers in your brain. I mean, smells and memories are are attached very, very yeah, close. There's so, like soul, that core thing. Exactly, and I think I think music works the same way. You know, you mm-hmm. sometimes I, I remember the first time I heard certain music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It always sticks with you. Like, you know, the first time you do an opera, it's like that's the voice you always have singing that role in your mm-hmm, ear, mm-hmm. like you know, for the rest of even, you know, 10 years down the road, when you do the opera, you always hear that first person singing that role next to you. I remember I was listening to hotel California, uh, when I was outside with my dad, while we were cutting trees of all things. And like, I remember like it was a a period of my life where I was kind of down and I was listening Mm -hmm. to like, uh, just like the space jam soundtrack. I don't know. in hotel California and like all this stuff. And I remember like walking around, like, in you know with the clouds it was cloudy the trees the leaves were kind of coming down and it's funny because i have no i don't care about the i don't care about the space sam soundtrack 35 years later however long right but like but i i knew exactly where i was when i yeah. heard it for the first or when i was like in that moment in my life it's so crazy how music can anyway let's shut up um <laughs> <laughs> retention went like this no but it's yeah. really it's a really important conversation it's a really important conversation around how powerful music is where it it like both is in the moment and it goes way beyond that and yeah, it's one of those things that, yeah and music is so intangible that you and i both know that we can't we can't really even though we have all these recordings it can't be pinned down there's no like we can't grab onto music and we can only like let it kind of flow through us and wherever it takes us is where it takes us. And if that's only the context of the game, that's fine, but it could be also so much more than that. Anyway. Agreed. Yeah. They're going to be like, Marco, you talk so fucking much. Let your guests talk. That's another main theme. Uh, totally opposite quality here. Um, this is from a game called kingdom hearts. Do you know kingdom hearts? I do not. You play as this character named Sora, and um, uh-huh. you are in the same universe as a lot of Final Fantasy characters, which is a very popular IP, and um, and also Disney characters. So, like, you partner up with oh. with Donald and Goofy, and you try to save Mickey, I believe. And like, there's a, I can't remember. I've only played part of the first one, but um, this piece, dearly beloved, is stunning. It's sublime.
a really a really really beautiful song. What do you what do you make of that? Ah, oh, it's gorgeous. I mean, mm-hmm. like I thought about saying things while it was happening, but I kind of just wanted to take that in. Like that was that was beautiful. Like it starts off with the soundscape, right? You think, oh, maybe this is an evening, maybe this is something, mm-hmm. but automatically, like that was a soundtrack to something tender, something beautiful. Like that was the music I want to be playing when I'm sharing a special moment with somebody or having a special moment in, you know, in just my own, my own life. Like, yeah, that was, that was a soundtrack to something lovely. I kind of get sad when, when, if someone listens to that and, and let's say they're not a fan of video game music or something and, and, what they hear is the droning of the arpeggiations. Like if you were to just focus on that, I think it it would be incredibly boring. But if you allow it to wash over you, I, I think it's an interesting thing when someone is allowing themselves to emotionally be vulnerable to a piece of music rather than looking at it from a critical and technical perspective, right? It's such a, it's such an interesting delineation that both exist within music and both are required to, to do it as a profession. But I sometimes think that we get caught up in the technicality and we forget to take a step back and just like admire how gorgeous this stuff is even on its own merit, you know? Yeah. I mean, Music doesn't have to be complicated, right? And some of the most beautiful, revered music out there is not complicated. You know, I, I mean, I, w- I was sort of thinking, you know, this is this is very canon and D, where you have bum, 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 mm-hmm. bum, 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 you know, like that's, that's the world you're living in, and that's it. But what you do with it, you know, and this, it was, it was the piano, you know, doing the arpeggiation and everything, but you had the reeds come in also and have these little flourishes. Yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, and and it was just, I mean, it's beautiful. I mean, it it's, it doesn't have to be complicated, it, as long as it makes you feel something. That's 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 the purpose of music. I you know we live in a world where where we realize that music is what emotions sound like, mm-hmm. right? right? Like uh, that's that's why we need music is because words aren't enough, so we have to color it with emotions, and emotions in the sound world are that's what music is, you know. Yeah. One million percent. And and it's our job as singers and as people that are sensitive to music and to, to, to help others understand how to access that because everybody has the capacity to access it. It's just a question of letting them know how, um, it's a really interesting responsibility. Um, it's fun too. It's fun. We, we get to do that. We get to interpret these things and we get to, you know, we're in the business of communication, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're vocalists, but we're in the business of communication. Like we have to take emotions and we have to interpret that with our voice and with our bodies and communicate a story. We're storytellers. So, but when you have something like that, like the story is already, it's already set up, you know, that mood, that Mm -hmm. that feeling. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. then we, you know, if there was a voice line on top of it, you add lyrics or, or just a vocal ease and, then you get to tell a story. It does its own thing. Well, speaking of vocalese, yeah. um, there's a really awesome track from this game called Warframe that I put like 140 hours in recently. And um, it's called This Is What You Are. And what's crazy about this track to me is um, I tell this story every time I like think about this song. When my dad, when I found out that my dad was sick, um, and I know you know all about this uh, from me and your own personal life and stuff, I, uh, this song is weird. It's, um, it's a really introspective and sort of rising, rising through discomfort and through pain type of song. And, uh, I remember I was, I would go to the gym and I would physically push myself to the point of like what I felt was breaking myself because I felt that maybe through my suffering, I could heal some of my dad's suffering. And so I have a very tender spot. I don't play it often for people because it's a very heavy, um, emotional feeling for me, but I also love it so much. Um, it also comes at a gorgeous moment in the game where you sort of have been playing this game for like 40, 60 hours. And you're kind of just going from planet to planet, just kind of doing the same thing. It's a little bit repetitive. And then there's a moment where everything changes and you discover what you are and who you are. And this song is just like so deep. So I'm really excited for you to listen to it.
Whoa, what a journey, man. Right. Oh, there are so many things to love about that. <clears throat> Whoa. Yeah. I feel like that was a little essay on like theme and exposition, right? Mm -mm. Like, yeah, da, 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 da. that's it. Mm -hmm. Like, what does that mean to you? And it's like, let me show you how many different things that can mean to you. How much is packed into that little sequence um, of like five notes or whatever that is. You know, it starts out, you have this low drone in the voice, blah, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then you have this one single melody pops out. You have the coro sort of repeat that melody. Yeah. And then you just, from that world, it's like, okay, let me show you everything that could possibly be packed into that. Yeah. You know, and I think, and it sort of guides you through it. Mm -hmm. It lets you see how much we can extrapolate from that little melody into this entire different world by adding, you know, you, you start off with that. It's a vocal thing. Okay. It sort of sets the mood. And then they add what sounds like an arhu, you know. Yeah, know well, it is. It is an arhu, yeah. yeah. Yeah, And so already you get this east meets west sort mm -hmm. of thing because it's mm -hmm. a very – And that's Warframe. That's Warframe in it of it itself. Yeah. Right. Which is which is an aesthetic that I love. Anytime that you can mix genres and yeah, stuff oh, like that, oh, it, oh. it's 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 a beautiful thing that makes you realize how limited, even just by using different instruments to play the same music, it takes you to a different world. I did uh, a concert with the um, the Chinese ensemble at the Bard Institute of, mm. of Music at, at the Bard College, and we were playing West Side Story stuff from Bernstein with traditional Chinese instruments. Whoa! And it just blew my. It was one hand, one heart, with like the pipa and the arms yeah. and everything. Oh, and dude! It is, I'll, I'll send you a clip of that because <sighs> just that soundscape was like, it was it was one of the most beautiful things ever. Um, wow! I'll send you a clip of our rehearsal of it because it really was. It was so special. So when you mix in the arhu, already it takes you to a different place. It gives you a different yeah. vibe. Right. And then you have, again, the percussion coming in. The taiko and drums so, coming yeah, in. Da, 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 da. I mean, it's all that same thing. And for people that don't study music or people don't dedicate their lives to it, it's it's like you hear a melody and you think, okay, this is a melody. But this like guides you through how much you can pack into this melody, how much you can take out of it, and how much it can actually take you on this journey. Mm -hmm. And then it goes back. You have the drums, and then it sort of combines things. And then it backs off a little bit, and then you have more of the percussion and some of the vocals. And then this whole orchestra comes in at the end, and then you add the arhu and the strings and everything, and you're just like, that was all packed in to that one little... And somehow at the end, you end up with this glorious soundscape that, you know, you would never know could have been the potential for that was in that five note melody. It's almost like the melody is a seed. And uh, yeah. all, as we build and build and build, the tree <clears throat> gets bigger and it grows and it, and it spreads its, its, its um, you know, its leaves and it becomes this big giant birch tree or, or a redwood or something. And it, and it really just, and then it's funny because then it actually comes back into itself. Right. And it like returns Absolutely. Like a, at the end of a night, the tulip closes its, its, its buds or its, its petals. And it's like quiet again. It's, it's fascinating how, yeah, that one. That one's like a a, a soul song, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so no, that's a, that's exactly what it's like. The seed. That's a beautiful thing that it's it's packed into this. A giant tree is stuck in that seed. Yeah, and you know, in this in this instance, it it sort of unpacks that little seed for you, and you get to see the soul within that seed and take a quick little journey through that. So, God, it's so good. I'm glad, I'm glad awesome. you like that one. Yeah, that one's yeah, for sure. Well, let, let's stay in, let's stay in that actually that East meets West here. Um, and, uh, hop over to, yeah, we'll hop over to phase two of Azdaha. So rage beneath the mountains. So in the game Genshin impact, uh, there's a section of Genshin that takes place in ancient, but it's ancient China. It's called Liyue and it's, it looks like ancient China and the rolling hills and giant mountain tops. And it's a stunning, stunning, stunning. I mean, they, they take real world locations and turn them into this beautiful, bright anime inspired colored landscape. And, um, 
this particular theme, Rage Beneath the Mountains, tells a story of this ancient uh, dragon god. And they actually use ancient Chinese uh, as text. And it's there's, I mean, countless tracks from this section that you that I could play for you that you would love. And and also their their Western stuff is so good. And there's also there's a Middle Eastern Persian Indian area that also is just is like stunningly beautiful. Obviously, the big horns represent this dragon, you know. Uh, here it comes. Yeah. I love that sound. The, the Arhu is like so warm. Oh. the ancient Chinese. Oh, I like that. Yeah. That's cool. I have such an affinity, honestly. Having, um, sorry, it went on to play something else. Here. Having spent so much time in China the past, you know, five years of my career and probably seven years at this point, like I've been around a lot of those traditional instruments, <clears throat> and I've been a lot, a lot of times <clears throat> when it's mixed with Western style symphonies and orchestras and things like that, and. I have such an affinity for those sounds that as immediately when I hear it, I'm sort of transported to a different soundscape. And like, I think it's such a missed opportunity for collaboration, for, you know, expansion of our, of what we know, you know, I mean, I think we're so in, in the Western classical world, we think Europe, that's where our tonal language comes yeah, from. That's exactly. where our music comes from. Yeah. We think of that as high art music. And we mm -hmm. we don't look at the rest of the world when we think of what is, you know, the musical traditions of value, you know, belong to Europe. 
is the, the, yeah. what we've sort of been taught in conservatories and, and just Western education in general. And so when you're in a place that you realize has a historical musical tradition that goes back further than the European one, and you think, how is it that we don't consider this when we think about, you know, the great musical traditions of the world? And so uh, anytime you get a chance to combine two different cultures musically, you're going to end up with something that is just more rich than, than what you have. So kudos to something like this in a game where it's like, and I think I'm, I'm sort of realizing in the video game world, this isn't a big deal. This isn't something that is that novel. It's just a different way to tell a story. And I think they they nail it right on the head. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. I mean, I, I want to play something for you that actually was pretty, pretty brazen uh, for the same company. Uh, it's called the Divine Damsel of Devastation. And it's actually uh, the first time that uh, that Chinese opera was brought to a Western audience. And as you can imagine, uh, the reception was mixed because a lot of people, younger people, especially were sort of confused by the soundscape of the Chinese opera singing. But I, because, because you have this connection, I feel like it's really important for me to, to show you. Uh, and this is Mihoyo is a Chinese company. So a lot of what they oh. do is, is rooted in that, the culture and the traditions while also bringing it to as wide a global audience as possible. Um, this one has a video that I think uh, you, you should watch. And this is like a bunch, this is a cutscene. Yo, that's cool. Isn't that neat? I'd take that. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's interesting. I, I have been to a lot of uh, more traditional sort of the Peking style mm. opera, right? I mean, there's, uh, there's an entire huge movement for Western style contemporary Chinese opera, but, you know, sort of in the Western style. But this is the, the traditional, right? So it it is 
people are, I, I would imagine the first time I heard this live, it, it blew my mind, sort of the, the type of vocal production that happens, you know, and I was like, ha, uh, I can't do that. Like, how, <laughs> how does that work? You know, but the, the art form in itself is fascinating in that it's sort of like, there's also this, like the stock like we have Comedia del Arte. Yeah yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. And so there's like the stock characters where you know the characters' movements and you know, like, this is built in storytelling, right? So looking at this, it was it was interesting because mine had the, the titles were on. I don't yeah, know if yeah, you're watching yeah, the yeah, titles yeah. or not, right? The titles, but I, I kind of got distracted by that. I don't, I don't know why, because I, I think I was trying to make sense of the, the plot. story by mm -hmm. looking at the titles and I was like, yeah, that, that's getting in my way right now of of sort of appreciating what's what's happening and I think that whenever you're faced with with good art is that like you you don't need that explanation you need the experience of of having an experience you know letting it wash over you and letting it be a part yeah. of that yeah I think yeah. I think we get hung up on really I need to understand this and a lot of times it's actually like well no actually Sometimes it's okay to not know what the hell you're looking at or what you're hearing and just sort of like ride the wave. I'll never forget when I first heard Charles Ives or um, Benjamin Britten. And I was like, bro, this shit fucking sucks. <laughs> and then, and then you like, you, and you're like, force yourself and you're like, oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm there. I can get it. I, I'm, I'm there. And you may never like fully like it, but you can at least like begin to like, it's weird. It's a weird, like, cause it's not, it's not open mindedness per se, but it's, but it's allowing the, it's allowing the headspace to just like <laughs> be, be tortured, so to speak, like, just, like, allow, you know, just allow yourself to be in it. Whatever you feel is valid, but just like, let it be felt, you know? Yeah. That was, that was me. The first time I, when I got to, to Cincinnati for grad school, I went up to, uh, with some friends, I went up to see Zalame at oh, the Lyric. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't Bro. exposed to us before. And like I got there, I was I was almost mad. I was like, this isn't music. <laughs> I was like, what is this? And um <laughs> since then I have become such a huge lover of Strauss. Yeah. But I haven't I haven't gone back to Zolome yet because Jeez. like there was something where that it just <laughs> it just really upset me. I'm not was, I'm not. <laughs> and like everybody I know that has sung that show, they're like it's amazing and i don't doubt it is but it's just funny where it was like in my musical development at that moment it was yeah. too much for me like i i was just overwhelmed by the tonal language and i was like <laughs> i don't understand any of this, this dude the first not. time the first time i listened to ariadne of noxos i literally was like no no i closed the score i literally got like five measures in i was like i can't i can't possibly do this i closed the score and I just I, then like two weeks later i was like all right i gotta learn the music so I like, yeah I like open I this thing up once you do once you're in though it's it's funny yeah zalame is tough though uh, zalame is tough even to watch because that shit is like brutal it's like not yeah. same with electra like those two pieces like it's just like it's too much and it's like wow this is heavy <laughs> It's, it, it was a lot and so like my my you know just arrived at grad school brain you know was like yeah i love opera and i was like what was that <laughs> <laughs> well like, let's uh, take me back let's pivot back to a latin soundscape i know oh. you like to dance a lot and uh mm -hmm. do you do like tango flamenco bachata what do you do so mostly like uh more social contemporary club thing. So, I mean, for that, it's like salsa, bachata, merengue, cumbia, you know? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is, um, this is more flamenco. So I don't, you're not, you're not as well versed in flamenco. I would assume. I mean, I'm a lover of flamenco, but I, I can't dance it. Yeah, that's fair. Well, I think you'll really like this. And actually it's funny. This, when I first heard this music from Ace Combat, I said to myself, there's no way I'm going to like music from a plane game. I just thought to myself, it's going to be like metallic EDM, which I actually love EDM now, like super crunchy and whatever. And just wait till you hear what I've got in store for you with Zero. It's one of the coolest songs ever made.
Here it comes. Cars, yeah. Yeah. And so I'm like, what? <laughs> you get some of the electronic thing, like, wow, wow, wow. But yeah, I should, I'll, I'll shut up. I, I love this one so much. <laughs> you feel that? Oh yeah. Yeah. You got the tacones, you've got the hand percussions, you've got the muted strings, the strumming, the rhythm yeah. on the guitar. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's just like bananas. Yeah. The counter harmony there is screaming. What would this look like on stage? Like it's it's, a, it's during a fight with your with a with your old like colleague, You're just flying around. But I'm thinking like if this was per performed live, like oh, what, what it would, would look the like, yeah, be right? on a, on a concert yeah. stage, like that would just be awesome. So this is zero live. Oh, and this is where was this in Tokyo? Tire in Japan, I don't know. I actually don't know where. So you're in a, you're in a, a duel with your like former friend and like squad mate. Uh -huh. I think. I see. And they've got they've got the other uh They've just got a few vocalists on mics is what they're doing. There's like four of them, yeah. yeah because yeah. of COVID at that point. Yeah. And someone included gameplay footage.
I love how tight the violins are too with the way that oh, they Oh, I know. I'm always amazed at by the sound of an orchestra and how versatile it is. Yeah. That solo soprano just cutting over top is so like that's beautiful. I love that this guy is like, like cross-legged. Is that what it's the traditional way of playing, I believe? Yeah. Do that, but. <laughs> you see how he's like looking over to like. They must have added something here, though, yeah. right? Yeah, like, that's not like hearing. That's more than just those voices, or it's something weird here. First of all, that's exactly what I was talking about. But I was, you know, I, I was wondering if I, they must have added in voices. I'm or sure they, afterwards, they did yeah. something like they some kind of post mix thing. But like the force is required to to do something like that. Um, and yet you're still you're still able to do that live. I mean, that, that's what I love about live music is that you can create that, right? Like, why not program more things like that? Here's my question. Hmm. You have all the people that would show up to something like that because they have a relationship to the game okay. or they have relationship to video game music in general. And they yeah. know that that is something that is accessible to them and that they enjoy. If that were just programmed at a regular, you know, concert when the symphony was doing, would everyone have the same reaction to that? I mean, I would think it would be amazing. That reminds me of the first time I saw Aina Damar, you know. Um, mm, mm, mm. And it's the same thing where you have guitars and you have the percussion and all these things. And that to me blew my mind. You know, I was like, whoa, this is the coolest thing ever, you know. And so I would have the same reaction to watching something like this. But do you think that folks without, um, you know, like what would... If you saw that composer, if you didn't know it was a video game composer, if you just saw it, you know, like what would get people in to see something like that? How would you advertise that? Uh, that's the question. And it's something that I'm, I am trying to figure out as I, you know, sort of ponder how to like take this out of this channel and bring it into the like populace. Like, how do you, how do you just do a video game concert? Do you integrate this stuff? Do you not tell anybody that you have video game stuff on the program? So that, cause I'm sorry, but no one outside of the video game music sphere, like in, in, in like a, a Western audience that would go to a concert like this with, you know, whatever, like flamenco or, or a pizza Yola or whatever, they would not know who Keiki Kobayashi is. But if you're like Keiki Kobayashi zero, they'd be like, Oh, must be a new composer. Right, an upstart. Mm -hmm. But Keiki Kobayashi has been composing in Japan for, you know, X amount of years. Sure. So it's like, sure, so sure. it's like, 
that's that's the, the that's the thing that kind of irritates me is that we have this divide where we have our beautiful little categories where we have well this is video game music this is pops music this is classical high art we can only because Mahler is better it's like I think you're wrong you know what I mean like I don't I don't know what the answer is and I, I'm trying to navigate that from so here's the fascinating thing and I run into this question all the time and we can I can think. You might have actually been in the room when this happened. But I remember one of our uh, in characterization classes that we had. Yeah. And I'll always remember this conversation that we had with Nick Muni. And what's up, Nick, if you're watching? Um, <laughs> who was one of my favorite directors in the world. Um, but anyway, what's up, Nick? Uh, he posed the question, what is the difference between art and entertainment? And it has haunted me ever since then. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and I, every time, like, I think about that question all the time. And I think about what is a delineation? Is there a delineation? And, you know, the thing that we came up with in the class, though, at that time is that entertainment is commercially driven. Entertainment is supposed to make money. Right. That's the purpose of entertainment. Right. Right. Art is, has no commercial sort of uh, delineation. Like, it's not designed to make money. Right. Right, right. And so it doesn't mean that entertainment doesn't include art in it. Of course it does. Right. It Movies, to. film, you know, I mean, like games, whatever, but it's entertainment. It's not art. Now it can be artful entertainment. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the big delineation that we run into is that people separate these things. And is it worth separating? I don't know. I mean, like that's, that's what I wonder, but if this were not tied to a video game, if this were just a composition that he made, that was not tied to a video game, would it have the same draw? Would it have the same value? And would it be thought of the same way? If this was just a composition that he put out into the world, mm -hmm. that was not tied to a video game, would people still think, oh, this is amazing? I mean, I think the music speaks to itself. But would people also be able to look down on it and be like, this isn't art, it's entertainment, you know? Yeah, it's such a, it's like in an alternate universe where none of this stuff is composed for video games and it's all like being played in modern. That's the thing that really rubs me is that it's like all this music is legitimate art. For, it's legitimate art and it's legitimate music that could, for the most part, it's, depending on what I'm playing for you, exists in a symphony hall and be part of a regular programming and it doesn't need to be so like it's, it's funny because we we complain and bemoan the fact that all these modern composers for the most part are producing academic at least they were 10 years ago when i was like actively engaging in it like right in, in 2019 was when i stopped so it's like at that point every modern composer i heard besides jake Heggie and like the guy who Ke kevin puts everybody else sucked no offense <laughs> I thought that modern operatic contemporary music besides those two was terrible and it was not melodic. It was very structurally academic, but then you turn over to video games, you turn on the TV and suddenly you're getting modern symphony. You're getting modern, like, you know, the evolution of Carl Orff, the evolution of classical music of Mozart, of Beethoven. And you're like, well, hold on. Why is that? Why is that being lauded as being better than this? Because this is simpler? Who fucking cares if the music is good and it moves you? Uh, well, here's the thing, right? And this is the question. That music is designed to make you like it. That is its purpose. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it needs commercial viability. It has to be something that is going to be easily digested. It is designed to make ears like it. Yeah. That's why you like it, because that is its purpose. So this purpose is not to so so music that is written for the sake of being written is somehow deeper than the music that is being made because you want people to like it. It's not deeper. I don't think it necessarily has more value. But no, like, no, yeah. But it's it's just that is its purpose. And here's okay, right? Let's play devil's advocate here for a little bit. It's like fast food. Mm -hmm. It's like food. Like, how can we make this more? We'll put, throw a little more sugar in here. We'll do a little bit of these things. And it's like, absolutely. We're going to develop a taste for that. And we're going to 
just start enjoying it more and more and more and more and more, right? Vegetables are like, yeah, it's, it's, it's all right, you know, but yeah. you know, like some vegetables taste it. Why would you eat that when you can eat this? This is really enjoyable. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't know. But I think that that is the delineation that happens. Like this music, you can't take a chance with, or maybe you can, I don't know. Play me some terrible video game music that nobody likes. Like it's hard because there's a bunch of people being like, nobody likes this. Why would you put this in a video game? And in the art world, there's not somebody going, nobody likes what you're composing. Why would you compose this? I mean, mm. once it premieres and it never happens again, like <laughs> <laughs> it's one premiere and then it never, yeah. Then, then it never shows up again, right? But this music is not designed to express what one person is singing. It is designed to be consumed by the masses, right? So you can't put out, you know, music that nobody likes on a video game because that's not its purpose. That's true. That's true. But it's all serving a contextual purpose because it's all there to move the story forward. And it needs to be there in order to be appreciated or in order to be, in order to connect us more deeply to the moments that are occurring. And that way it's very similar to opera where if you don't have the music to drive the plot forward, you don't have the thing. And I think it's the same way. You can have gameplay, you can have art, you can have all this other stuff like design and things. But if you don't have the music, the, the game just falls flat. There's, there's nothing you can't, it, there's nothing to go off of. It doesn't. Absolutely. I mean, it's like, what's like watching a movie without a film score? Like you don't even realize it's happening half the time. And then, you know, you see a clip of Jurassic park without the music and you're like, yeah, it's weird. Wow. That wasn't the same. I, I mean, you, you bring up a good point though, where it's like, yeah. And I'm curious to see what the comments will say about that, because I think it's a really interesting idea that like, well, if this music is meant to be consumed and digested in a palatable way, then is it truly art? But then I'll tell you that people actively cry when they listen to these pieces of music, not because of necessarily the context, but the context, yes, could be, yes, but also because it moves them and ultimately is moving somebody more important than than creating something for art's sake you know what i mean and 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 that's the other thing like i'm sure that bach would have been pretty happy if someone was moved by the by the um the variations there or beethoven's nine well probably beethoven didn't give a fuck but you know what i mean like mozart would have wanted people to smile when they heard some claret or clarinet concerto you know what i mean or a piano concerto because he absolutely it's an interesting discussion it is. I, I think it's fascinating. I, I think about this a lot. But yes, I mean, if you are moving people to tears and emotion and everything, like that is the purpose of music, right? That's right. that's what we started out talking about. Music is what emotions sound like. If you can affect somebody in that way, that is the purpose. I also think that is the purpose of art, is to engage in a human reaction, right? To yeah. make someone feel something. You can hate it, you can love it, you can think it's great or whatever, but if it makes you feel something, an emotional discourse. mission accomplished, right? Yeah, right. But, right, when you have so many, like, I can only imagine the amount of people working on a video game, right? And the amount of trial and error, right? It's, it's kind of like opera. I'm, I'm sorry, it's kind of like Broadway, mm -hmm. musicals. Uh, Broadway's entertainment. Right. Because it is designed to be commercially viable, right? Mm -hmm. You have so many people investing in it. It's all about making your money back and then making money. How long can this show run and everything? The purpose of Broadway is to make money. Musicals, right? So you have so many, you do a national tour, you do edits, you do all of these things. How can we make this make the most money when it becomes commercially available to the masses, right? It has to be that good because we need people to like it. We need people to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Right. That is the purpose of that. Along the way, you end up with some amazing musicals that make people cry and to make yeah, people of feel all these emotions. Right. But you have so many iterations of this is like, how can we get this to be palatable to the most people possible? Right? But isn't that, but are you talking about like the commodities before we get off on that? We should dial it back before we get too far into this. But, but I am curious yeah. because wouldn't you say then that anytime you commoditize art at all, that's when it loses, that's when it loses its like truest, most pure form. If you I mean, cause, cause if you look at it that way, then the Met, the Met is not producing art. It's producing entertainment. I suppose it is because they have to fill the seats. You know, so like at what point? Right, but they're not making it, money off of it. 
they're losing money. Like opera, <laughs> anytime it gets produced, it loses. It's more expensive to produce than it producing is producing opera than it is to. Right, and like when people write, it's not necessarily you know people are trying to say what will the most people like about this. You know, yeah, that's when you get the composer say, you know, this is what I do, and mm-hmm. they put it out there. People they like put it, it right if they yeah, don't yeah, like right. it. Yeah. You know? That's why you like a guy like George, or, well, George Crumb, but also like a guy like, um, oh my God, what's his name? John Cage. Like John yeah. Cage was just like, fuck it. Here's me sitting at the piano Bring for the four piano. minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. I, mean, I mean, I don't know. Like as I've become more and more enveloped in this like world of video game music and like sort of advocating for it, I tend to just say no. I, 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 this is art because yes, it's, it's made for its purpose ultimately is to be consumed from a financial perspective, but I don't believe that composers are sitting here writing because they have to make something financially viable. I think that they're writing something because they want to express some sort of emotion. And then that is then what's gets packaged and sold in a complete package. But I don't think any composer that you talk to in the modern world right now is saying, I need to do X, Y, Z. So I make the most amount of money possible from this composition, you know? Yeah. But I think we develop languages, right? We develop vocabulary and we develop languages and a lot of languages in the world are dying because not a lot of people speak them. Right. But we figure out what are the languages that most people speak and let's focus on those. Right. Yeah. And then you end up with sounds that people say, like the first piece that we listen to, right? Mm, it's like, mm. oh, it's this. It reminds me of this. It reminds me of this. It reminds me of this. I'd be curious, like, what's like some terrible video game music? Do we get a lot of terrible video game music? Um, let's see. <laughs> I'm going to love it. Watch. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Bad video game music. Again, but this is all like, let's see. Yeah, I mean, here you go. Spider-Man 2, the game pizza theme, uh, I guess. <laughs> I don't even know that this counts, though, but this is just this is just like a tarantella. <laughs> I mean, it's just a tarantella, right? It's going to be the top. <laughs> Okay. Okay. This isn't necessarily terrible. Um, and this no. is, but I mean, on, that's, hold. that's a traditional Neapolitan song, right? Yeah. 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 Well, hold on. What's Sonic Chronicles of the dark brotherhood, central city. That's good. That sounds like my counterpoint composition exercises. Like, <laughs> <music theory. laughs> okay. Well, okay. Well, like, P- okay. How about this one? So pizza tower, I wouldn't say that it's, it's, I wouldn't say that it's bad, but I would say that it's jarring. Uh, okay. But like that Sonic thing was, oh, sorry. Did my video freeze? I did. That's it? the worst freeze ever. Oh no! Is that what I look like? What you're saying is there's no bad video game music because writing bad music is not possible because you can't ship a product out that has bad music. I don't know. It just occurred to me, like as we're having this conversation, right? Like you need to do an episode on the worst video game music, mm. and like tell people to write in, like what is the worst video game music and why is it bad? I'm curious. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. I mean, yeah, I'm curious now too because, like, surely if you have, if, you ha- if it has to go through so many hands, if it has to have so many eyes on it, if it has to have this, like, there has to be a general consensus of what is good, what is effective, what is going to make sense in the moment, and what you're like, no, that doesn't work. People aren't going to react to this. People aren't going to like it. Mm-hmm. And is that a bad thing? Maybe I mean, if all operas did that, we would have sweet operas, like. <laughs> We would have really good contemporary operas. But at that point, you could also just ask an AI bot to do it. Right. Because at thing. that point, it's just a collection of things that we know are going to be successful. successful. 
Yeah. I mean, that's a really interesting perspective that I've never thought of because to me, I've just always felt like, Oh, what a huge treasure trove of really talented composers. But yeah, like why does everything sound good? Hmm. Do I care? <laughs> you know, that's the big, that's the biggest question, right? Do we care if it's, do we, I don't know, man, like we're, we're coming into that world really, really soon where AI is able to rate music. AI is able to produce images. And yeah. a lot of people, I know a lot of commercial companies are like, why would I pay a model when I can just create the ad without human interaction when it's going to be exactly what I want it to be. And I don't have to worry about, you know, does somebody have a lazy eye? Does, you know, does someone's mm -hmm. uh, flower garden not look exactly the way I want it to? I mean, we see it all the time. You know, I, I had a colleague that I was getting on yesterday because they took a picture of themselves and they were sitting there editing it for half an hour. And I was like, uh, like, it's just, sometimes the picture of something is just fine. Like, it doesn't have to look perfect. And once you get used to something being perfect, you never it's want really hard to go it. back. Yeah. It's really hard to go back. Well, should we listen to some more perfect video game music? Yeah, it's so delightful. Like, why wouldn't <laughs> I want to listen to it? <laughs> but I see your points. And these these are very interesting thoughts. And they're very interesting perspectives. Because because you're right. And, and, and again, at that point, it's like, well, is it art or is it or is it, or is it entertainment? And you know, what, what's the delineation there? If, if there is one and does it matter? This is why this question haunts me all the time. Cause I love entertainment. I really, really do. But when I catch whiffs of something being like, is this art or entertainment? Like I, I check myself. I don't know why, but I do sometimes. But so this, this got spurred because you listened to zero. So did you feel like zero was leading more towards art than entertainment? I I got spurred on it because watching people perform it live, there's an artistic quality to that, right? You have to be an artist to be able to do those things. Yeah. Now, artists playing things that we don't consider are art. Like, what? I don't know. That's weird, right? Like, it just, these are like the things that go on yeah. in my brain. Because if, if video games are entertainment, then how come you're getting composer that composes the music who's also conducting it and then also playing the piano at parts? If he's clearly an artist, then is the thing that he made just entertainment or is it art because he's an artist who, who made art? And it's just like this crazy paradox where it's like, well, what's it the... <laughs> like, if you get commissioned to do something, like, it stops being art, right? Like, someone's right. paying you to to, to right. write this music this song is called uh they might as well be dead from uh, risk of rain 2 uh, <clears throat> it's by <clears throat> it's by chris christodolu and um it's awesome then and yeah now now every song that i play for you is just is art <laughs> is art for art's sake let's do it it's all good man i mean i don't know what to tell you or it could just be that there's like a treasure trove of just talented fucking people that just are like i'm just talented and i this is the the spot that I found where to put the good stuff, you know? I don't know. It's a different corner of Asia here. Yeah. Yeah.
was kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's like synth quality. Yeah. happening in the game while this music is playing i don't know i don't know i've never played i've played risk of rain for like 10 minutes i'm assuming you're on a planet you're shooting things you're like dodging and trying to avoid stuff actually now i'm kind of curious uh hold on (laughs) like because i I imagine that this could just kind of be on loop right it could be it could sort of be going on i don't know if this gets played in its entirety and it's like that was a moment or if it's just sort of like music that's happening while other things are going on right yeah i don't know that's a question for the comments but i genuinely don't know i I haven't played the game enough to to know i'm pretty sure it's on a loop in the background while you're trying to the the point of the game it's uh it's it's to survive and it's to get to a point where you're finding this this thing that you activate a boss, a giant enemy comes out, you kill the enemy, you stay in this like space until the timer kind of resets and then you hop into the teleporter and go to the next level. And it gets increasingly more difficult as the level, as the time, the longer you're in there, the longer the harder it gets. It's the type of game where like if you die, you restart from the very beginning. So there's a lot of, there's, there's stakes, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it's just curious because this one to me is like, I like the soundscape of it, but as like a composition, it's just sort of, it doesn't feel like it's much. It sort of follows that. It's like, okay, it's going to start out chill. All right. Then it's going to kind of grow. It's going to kind of grow and then it just kind of grows, but it doesn't, uh, like it doesn't find its way into sort of a, a, a real arc. It just, mm-hmm. it just kind of, it just kind of does its thing, like, which made me think there's got to be something else happening during this time. It can't just be sort of like a standalone sort yeah. of, but I think, yeah, if it's a background piece or, or something like that, then, then the, that works. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, that's an interesting point, too. I, I love that song. Uh, it, it's, it's interesting how, but again, I think it has to do with my own personal context, because that music reminds me of the music that I was listening to when, when I was a kid with my dad. So that... Uh-huh triggers some sort of nostalgia in me we're going back to context that's created by our lives and yeah. i feel like that's probably why i'm so attached to that piece but it's interesting how you're like well what's happening because that doesn't necessarily have like a a, a through line <clears throat> dude i don't know it's crazy well, that's, that's, the, that's the big thing about music right is that like everyone interprets it we can all be listening to the same thing and yet we yeah. all have a different reaction to it yeah yeah let's let's listen to uh a couple opera tracks because i feel like i can't have you on here without exposing you to some opera and so the first one i want to uh, play for you is uh this it's from it's called morning light hymnus it's from a game called grand blue fantasy and um it's pretty cool it's 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 very much um prog rock meets opera Um, And it's fun in that way.
organ in there. Oh, the Carmina. Yeah, they, they all do. <laughs> what is opera involved? It's like a modern day oratorio. Like, we all know people that are metalheads and opera buffs, right? Mm -hmm. Like, there is, there is that sort of draw between, like, what is super hardcore about metal and what is super hardcore about the physical act of singing opera. Like, it's this heightened, really emotional, strong uh, creation of sound and, and, and emotion and, like, it works together, right? Like it, it just, it just kind of works together. I, it's, it's, it's fun to listen to. It, the thing that trips me up about stuff like this is that, like, as a singer, I'm like, you can't sing over that. Like, how are you going to sing <laughs> that, right? Like, it just, there's something that feels not natural about that soundscape, which is also the appealing part of it, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it, to me, it really does feel like this evolution of the thing, you know what I mean? Which is, is fascinating because yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it's probably not very practical, but there are ways to do it in, in a way. But like, I just, I just imagine like a, like a full blown, like mass, like a box St. Matthew passion, but prog mm -hmm. rock with opera underneath and with a chorus. And I just think like how crazy it would be if you were to just stick that in an opera hall or like a concert hall. And just like the balls that it would take to do something like that, you know? That would be awesome. Could you do it not mic though? No, you'd have to mic, but who cares? Man, I don't know. I think something gets lost when you mic. And I realize that a lot of opera houses mic now too, right? Just because of the realities of the space and everything. Yeah. But there is something about literally when when you hear a human voice in an acoustic space, like we create sound waves, right? Like that is sound traveling through space and yeah. it's vibration. When you hear a human voice in a live space, that voice is physically that person reaching out through space and touching you, right? Like that person is touching you through space physically. Yeah. yeah. What they're creating is touching you. As soon as you put it through a speaker, it's not a human voice anymore, right? Mm. Like you still have vibrations. But what I think is so emotional about hearing a baby cry, about hearing someone scream, about hearing someone laugh, is that someone is touching you through space, like through the void. And I think it's, I think it, there's a different visceral human reaction to that. Once you put it through a sound system, it's no longer a human voice that's touching you. I, I think mean, it's that's a human voice. That's a fair point. In that case, that you know, if you put them further down in a pit, you know, maybe it's possible to have electric guitar just like lower the amp. I mean, it's possible, but it's tough I though think because it would be cool though. yeah, like it, it would it would it would be rad. Like I want to figure out how that works, right? Because if you can hear all those things in a space together, like it's a cool sound. It just doesn't like to me. It just doesn't sound 
like that's possible. It doesn't sound real, you know, like. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm spending too much time in, in concert halls and opera houses. I, I mean, but again, but that's the difference between like something that's done in a studio and something that's done live. Like how do you transport that to a live performance and can you, and will it have the same qualities as it has in the, in the recording? And that's, that's the thing is that recording. I'm super fascinated by it. I'm curious yeah. about it. Recording, you can, you know, you can spend 10 hours fiddling with the tenor voice and whatever. It's, it's, I think also too, like the naturalness of like, you only get one go. I mean, it's interesting. And then here's another one, a God Shattering Star from Fire Emblem Three Houses, which is like the closest thing to an opera aria, I would say, or a tenor aria. And, and I don't necessarily like the singer in it, but it's a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty powerful piece of music. That's high. Yeah. They're B flat. I, I, I'm working on a cover of it. It's, it's brutal. It, it's brutal. Oh, it just goes right back to it, too. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. right. <laughs> no, right. You need someone to draw on that? Uh, it's days in the passaggio right here. Watch this. Uh, I think it's a G. That's a G, yeah, because yeah, you can't, because it's like... And then this. It's legato, but it's, it's I like yeah, that. rigid. Yeah. And this is the light motif of the game that they throw into this. <laughs> On the off. Back up to the middle. <laughs> oh, fucking brutal. <laughs> He's layering, she just gets higher and higher. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> But like that's such a sweeping orchestra though. Oh my god. Oh no, yeah. Alright, of all the things that I've heard today, that to me was the thing I'm probably the most intrigued by and got most excited by for sure. Mm. Like, because at least coming from the human voice standpoint and the operatic standpoint, like yeah, of course. that's possible. That's not easy, but I think that's possible. I think that's what gets me so excited about that. Yeah. Is that I was like, I want to see someone do that. I want to see someone do it. Cause I think, it would be a beast, but we, we all know pieces like that where you're like, it's a beast and not very many people in the world can, but the people that can, it's like, that's special. 
Well, what's the difference between that and Dique Lapida? Or, you know, yeah, well, actually probably, or like, you know, any of those particular arias that are like that. It's, it's, it's brutal. And, and, but again, I mean, the benefit is that they're in a recording studio. So like if a cut doesn't work sure. get back in there, but like, I would like, I'm trying to work up my way up. It's taken me like two years to like get the courage to even attempt it. Cause this shit is brutal. But like, my goal is to do it in one take and it just like, you know, cause, cause you're doing that. That's, I do that's, doing that that's what sure. we used to have to do. So like, it's like, why hide behind multiple takes of something that is so operatic, but it's brutal. I mean, it, like for people that don't know, I mean, this is like so high. And also when it's not high, it's also sitting it's in the crazy. middle and it just creeps into the. So if we think about the voice, the lower part is like a, like a, think of an hourglass, right? The lower part. And I'm not talking to you, Jose, cause I know you know, but the, the lower part of the, cause you imagine Jose, let me explain this to you, Jose. The Please, lower part I of the voice. Ready. <laughs> I need some lessons anyway. The lower part of the voice is, is like an hourglass, the bottom half. Then as you come up into the middle voice where it's, we switch into kind of a head voice. Uh, you ever seen the Glenn close where she goes and the home of the free. It's so funny because she hits her cap and then she has to switch into head voice to get up to the upper register. It's so funny. For the land of the free, free. So then we thin out and then we open back up. That's the problem with an aria like this that's incredibly brutal. And because you're so intrigued, I've got one more for you that's operatically based called Nostalgia Phantasm that's live. And let me tell you, this is one of the coolest fucking things I've ever heard. And it might as well just be the Verdi Requiem. That's the actual voice actress for the character. Got it. And this is her theme when you fight her. Okay. It's just Verdi Requiem. The Verdi Requiem right there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the soprano is here. The, this is the key here in a second. I was like, oh. 
Mask of the Phantasm then. Third time. Third time, jeez. I think I got some goosebumps though, man. Are you kidding me? That is effortless for her as just cutting. I love this conductor too. Yeah. The the applause. I would have been jumping out of my seat at the end of that. That's the thing, you know, like it's like, yeah, there is a core, a Carl Orff, uh, a, a Verdi Requiem aspect to that. And it, it, you could be reduct, you know, a, a contrarian or a, sort of reduce it to like, well, they're just em- emulating something that happened. It's not that creative, but I listen to that and I'm like that, that is the goods, you know, that's, that's the good stuff, you know? Absolutely. I mean, I don't know how you would deny, you know, being emotionally invested in what's happening. That shit is exciting. It is visceral. It is in your face. Like, it, you know, like that'll scrape the paint off the walls, you know. To me, there's an element, though, that seeing it live, like seeing the forces put into that, feeling that the energy of it is so different when I'm watching, you know, even if it's a video of it, I'm not in the concert hall, obviously. But like, seeing the video of it like we know what goes into creating those sounds we know what goes into the conductor all that energy it's just this like like a nuclear core that's just burning 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 and we feel all that energy in there so that for me like is a huge bump to it had you just played me that track and i wasn't watching a live performance of it i would have still appreciated that like wow this is awesome but again my mind would have gone to what would that sound like if it was performed live like mm-hmm. what would that feel like what would that that do so because like a, none of the stuff you play me is not good you know it goes back to that like this all serves its purpose i'm sure it does really well it's all it makes me feel things no matter what but when i see something like this and i see it live like for some reason like the merit of it pops out when I'm seeing people perform it live. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that's about, but, but yeah. I appreciate it a million times more when I watch it. And like, kudos to the actress. Cause all I can think about is like, what do we do with our hands? Like, the festival. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, I'm standing up here. Oh, should I do like, you know, uh, the, every opera singer in the world. What do I do with my hands? Um, <laughs> I just was up there for the, Six and a half minutes being like, what should I do with my hand? <laughs> I know. I know. Well, listen, man, I really appreciate you coming on. And, you know, I think, I think you, you brought up some really good points that are definitely going to make me think about stuff. But also in general, I think it's, it's really good to get someone who appreciates what's up here, but also has the intelligence to be like, but is there more? Could it be more? And, and what does it look like if it is more? And I think that that's something that's really important to me. Um, you know, and, and, and as I continue to advocate for 
for the music of of video games and its its relevance in, in the world and 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 I do think it's important and I do think that it's it's valuable. So having your perspective on it is uh, is enlightening for me as well. So I appreciate that. It's a, it's like the questions are also more important to ask ourselves, right? Like, why do we think this is more valuable? Why do we look at art different than entertainment? Like, what is those? Like, are we just stuck in this world where we want to like? create a divide here because again all this music creates emotion it creates a human emotion if that's not what art is then i don't know what it is right but like a lot of these things i was just like playing devil's advocate being like okay but is there a distinction is there what is that distinction what does that say to us about humans like are we going down a dark path or are we just trying to hold on to something that really has no value or the value is perceived as a way to distinguish one class from a different class you know like those are the questions that are interesting to me yeah yeah and they're great questions to ask um feel free to check out jose uh, all his information is in the bio uh the about section and uh yeah thanks a ton jose and we'll see y'all later okay bye everybody right. see you later